We already heard that Peter is writing to Christians who were scattered or what we call the Great Dispersion. Uh, they were marginalized for their faith and they were probably questioning their situation. Uh, they were probably discouraged. They were thinking, do we retreat? Do we go back and go into this cocoon and do we just stay away from society or do we retaliate uh, or do we assimilate into this new culture that we are in? But Peter says, and Peter wants to encourage his readers by telling them that the option is not to retreat or to retaliate or to assimilate, but to stand firm in the word of God. The good thing is that when Peter calls us to be exiles or sojourners in a foreign land, he doesn't just tell us to be exiles, he tells us how we can be exiles. And in chapter 2, we see that we get this instruction from Peter, and he's giving it to us and telling us how we can live as exiles in this world. So I've titled the message this morning as Living as an Exile. And we look through chapter 2 this morning, the first half of chapter 2. And we need the instruction that Peter is giving, not only to this generation, but generations to come. Because we truly need to learn to live as exiles. Today, the gospel is considered dangerous and harmful at times. Traditional family and sexual morality are being questioned. Being a follower of Christ has not been easy in the past, and I don't think it's going to be easy in the future. To live a successful Christian life, I think it would be good for us to heed the instructions that Peter gives us in this letter. We should also remember that Peter was no stranger to suffering himself. So this morning, I want to quickly run through what we learned in chapter 1. Uh, Peter encourages his readers to stand strong in the faith amidst persecution. And in verses 1 through 13 of chapter 1, Peter introduces us to the gospel. He calls us exiles. And he says, look forward to the living hope that we have in Jesus. As things get difficult and you are being marginalized, let the living hope that is there be the fact or the reason for your motivation. In verses 14 through 16, he calls us to be holy because our Father is holy and children need to imitate the Father. In verses 17 through 21, he calls us to live a life with reverential fear or awe that understand that our sins have consequences for us and our communities. Finally, on top of telling us to have this living hope. He says to be holy, have this reverential fear. He adds love. He calls us to put love in action towards one another in our gospel-centered communities. He says be fully committed to loving one another, not in a lukewarm fashion, but he says love with intent. He says love in a way that mimics your father's love for you. He says, the more you can understand the Father's love, the more you will be capable of loving others. We have learned these truths from chapter 1, and Peter is going to guide us on how to live as exiles and why we should live as exiles in the first part of chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles with me this morning, will you follow with me as we read from 1 Peter chapter 2, and we will read the first 12 verses. You can follow along uh, with me. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that it, by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious." You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, 
But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10 says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11 and 12 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. Father, we have been challenged by it. And Father, we pray that even as we study it together today, that we would take care of the things that we need to take care. And we would be sharpened and we would be transformed into the likeness of your son. Father, I pray that you would not allow me to say anything that you would not want me to say this morning. And Father, that the study of the word would be enriching and that you would enable us to do the things that you've called us to do. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So in the chapter 2, Peter helps us on how we are to live as an exile. How do I live as a stranger or exile in a foreign land? Peter says that we need to develop a mindset of an exile, to develop a mindset of an exile. If you go with me to chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action. And if you go to chapter 1, verse 20. Three, it says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So the connecting phrase here in, that starts off chapter 2, he says, on the basis of that, he says, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. How do I live as a stranger and exile in a foreign land? He says, by developing a mindset that puts away evil communication that is not fit for an exile. He uses five different words. He says malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. All of these words that he uses are for the gospel community. It is not for somebody on the outside. He says your communication between each other has to be one that produces love. You know, he says, put away. It's like taking off an old dirty coat and throwing it and, and getting rid of it once and for all. You know, malice means an angry dislike of someone. When was the last time that we were angry with someone? For the way they spoke, for the way they treated us. Deceit, saying something, but meaning something else. When was the last time we perhaps, you know, said something that we did not mean? Hypocrisy does not reveal oneself. Envy, longing for something that is not ours. Slander, saying untrue things. Peter is asking us that we must love one another. And these things, this way of communication will destroy a gospel community. You know... Uh, one of the ways we communicate today is social media, right? We, we tend to be able to do all of the things that we do on social media. We give updates. We, we know what's happening around the world. We know what's happening in our friends' lives with social media. And I think many of these words that Peter uses are so difficult to manage even in the social media that we so frequently engage. We're always called to compare ourselves with others, right? And so Peter is saying, we cannot have this kind of communication. He said, you develop a mindset that puts away evil communication that is not fit for an exile. You know, I think the question that we need to ask this morning is, how am I doing in this area? 
How is my communication? Do I need to work on a healthy mindset in my communication? As I look back at this last week, did I do my very best at putting away this style of communication, at doing the things that God has called us because you've been born again? You know, he says, you have to put away this way of communication. Number one was a mindset that puts away evil communication. Now, how we are to live as exiles in a foreign land. Number two is a mindset that cultivates a healthy appetite for the living word. You know, consuming the living word or developing a healthy appetite does not happen by accident. You know, we think that we can do these things and, you know, you know just as we have another birthday and we grow older, we will naturally become spiritually mature. You know, if I asked you all this morning, hey, come join me to run a marathon race tomorrow, uh, I think most of you may not lift up your hands. You'll say, hey, I don't think we've trained enough. Uh, I don't think we've, we're ready to run a marathon. And it's no different in the spiritual walk that we have. We've got to train ourselves. We've got to eat the right food. We've got to exercise. We've got to do the right things. And Peter uses this image here. Like newborn infants, in verse 2, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow into salvation. You know, a newborn baby does not need to be reminded that it needs milk. When it's hungry, it's going to cry, and the mom is going to feed it milk. I think of uh, my son Micah. When he was very young, uh, he was an avaricious eater. And when he had moved from drinking his mother's milk and he'd moved to a bottle, when he woke up in the morning, he would be super, super upset. So what my wife, or I would do mostly my wife, would heat up and warm up a bottle of milk and make sure it was there by the bedside table so as soon as he woke up, we could plug his mouth with the milk so that he would not bring down the roof. And Peter is telling us the same thing. Peter is asking us, if you were born again, why are you not having an appetite for the spiritual milk? Step back and take an inventory of what we desire on a daily basis. Can I say this? What we crave is what we will consume. Let me repeat that. What we crave is what we will consume. One of the questions that we can ask ourselves today is, do I want to grow to be more like Jesus? How is my spiritual health? What am I consuming on a daily basis. If I want to live like an exile, if I want to do the things that God has called me to do, then what am I consuming on a daily basis? He says we need a mindset that puts away evil communication, a mindset that cultivates a healthy appetite for the living word, and the third mindset that he asks us to do is a mindset that understands my new identity. Who am I? It's nice that we went through the book of Ephesians with Pastor Subash. We talked about our identity in Christ. Many a time, someone or something is defining who you are. Your identity is something that I think when I talk to people is something that most people struggle with, but they don't know that they're struggling with their identity. When you are born into this world, your parents and your teachers and everybody that you associate with is going to try at framing your identity. The world always says, if you add this to your life, then you can be better. A single, you know, boy or girl, the thing may be to say, hey, you know, if you add a spouse to your life, then things will be better. If you are a little taller, things may be better. Or if you're a little, uh, you know, more capable, this, then you may be a little better. But let me tell you something, friends. No one can fill that void except Jesus Christ. So Peter gives us, and he challenges us, to live out this new identity. He says, 
Why don't we look at and understand this new identity that we have in Christ? In verse 5, he says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. We are his home, a place for God's dwelling. What an amazing thought. Pastor Subash preached a message uh, on the church and he spoke about us being living stones. I would encourage you, if you have not listened to that message, to go back and listen to that series. It was a wonderful series on how we are living stones. You know, in the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam and Eve, he dwelt with them in the garden. When sin entered the world, what happened? Adam and Eve were asked to leave God's presence. And then God dwelt in the tabernacle, and then in the temple, and then God sent his son, Jesus, as a baby, who then died on that cross of Calvary, and rose again, and was the living stone that is mentioned here in verse number 4 and 5. He says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. That you and I are being built up on this cornerstone, the living stone, as all living stones, so that God can continue and come and reestablish his residence with us. What a beautiful thought that God himself is residing with us. Verse 9, if you talk about identity, everybody will bring you to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen race. What does it mean to be a chosen race? We have become part of a chosen race through the gospel. He says you are part of a gospel community and this should motivate you. God's choosing is not like man. If any of you have applied for a job or tried to join a sports team, you've made this big resume, you've added everything, tried to make sure that all of the things line up really well, and then you send out your resume hoping that you get selected, and if you are trying to be a part of a team, you've looked at all of the skills that you can display, and you're hoping that based on your skills that you will get selected into a team. But God's choosing is not like that. God didn't choose you because you had a big resume or because you had a skill set. God chooses you simply because he loves you. Isn't that amazing? To think about the fact that you and I are chosen by God simply because he loves us, simply because he's merciful, simply because he's gracious. You know, many a times... We don't think of the fact when we live as exiles that you and I are chosen by God. Peter wants his readers to understand that Jesus' status is our status because we are in Christ. Peter is reminding the marginalized Christians, do you realize that you were chosen? He's asking the same question to us this morning. He's asking us, do you realize that you are chosen? He doesn't stop there. He says, not only were you chosen, you are a royal priesthood. What does it mean to be a royal priesthood? That we are royal as sons of God, and that means we're sons of the king, and priests serving God and man. Our daily actions are an opportunity to represent God and serve the people around you. What a privilege that you and I have to be a royal priesthood. It was, the fact was that only the king could be the king and the priest had to be the priest. But then God says, you are a royal priesthood. Exodus 19, 6 says, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And the same privilege now has been given to us. He doesn't stop there. He says, you are a holy nation. There was great pride in bringing a Roman citizen. You know, we have the G20 in India right now, and, you know, presidents from all over the country, other countries are now visiting India. And we are uh, the country that's leading the G20 this year, and I'm sure that it, you know, there's a, there's a pride factor in the fact that we are, uh, you know, as India, now able to host uh, uh, the G20 in India. 
A few weeks ago, we landed uh, you know, in the, on the moon. And everybody was sending postcards and saying, wow, India finally made it. We, we landed on the moon. And I know that pride filled up in our hearts. Peter's pointing out to them and saying that your position in Christ is better than being a Roman citizen. Peter's telling them that you are a nation because God has chosen you to be a holy nation. You don't have to worry that you are marginalized and on the side, on the fringe, that you don't have uh, what others have. He says you don't need to worry about that because you are a holy nation. He says you are a nation within another nation, and you are to show forth God. Finally, he says, a people for his own possession. Just like the children of Israel were God's special possession, we have become God's possession in Christ. We belong to God, not because we are special, but because of who owns us. Let me repeat that. We belong to God, not because we are special, but because of who owns us. You know, when we go to the office, we have an ID tag, um, and uh, we wear it around our necks telling us who we are. And when I checked my bags in, in Chicago to come to India, I received a tag that said, I own those six suitcases that I checked in. What's special about this is that the ID tag that we wear around our necks or you know, in our purses or wherever we keep says that we belong to God. What a beautiful thought that you and I are God's possession. In verse 10, he says, you are God's people. Peter quotes a lot from the Old Testament. And he's quoting from Hosea 2.23. He says, you know, for a season, God had to punish them. That's the Israelites. And they were taken into captivity only to return back to God and become God's people again. Peter is using this to tell us that once we did not belong to God, but now we belong to God. What a thought. He says in verse 10 again, you have received mercy. He says you did not have mercy, but now you are clothed with mercy. Peter is urging us that we should have a mindset that understands our new identity. If we are to live as exiles, then we are to understand our new identity. So we are to have a mindset that puts away evil communication, a mindset that cultivates a healthy appetite for the spiritual word, a mindset that understands my new identity, and fourthly, he says, we are to have a mindset that flees from evil. In verse 10 and 11, which actually acts as a pivot between the first section of this chapter and the last section of this chapter, he says in verse uh, number 11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Number one, we need to realize that we are at war. There's a war for your soul. It's not easy to, to live the life and not be aware that there is a war for our soul. The devil and the world are throwing things at us all the time, wanting to take control of our soul. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. You know, many times when we say we have to, you know, um, realize that there's a war for our soul, we think, you know, I've got this. I know I can do this. But what Peter is saying is, don't forget that if you want to live as an exile, the world and the devil and the passion of this world is going to get you. And you have to realize every day that you wake up that you are at war. You know, you look at Daniel and you see that he was taken as an exile. He was a captive in Babylon. And when he lived there, he had all of the things that the others chose. But what did Daniel do? Daniel said, no, I, I don't want to do this because this is, go this is going to affect my God. Taking care of our souls is very important. And Daniel was a good example. Another thing he says, he says abstain. Abstain from the passion of the flesh. What does it mean to be abstain? 
He says, stay away, don't sample. You know, uh, the problem with sampling the passions of the flesh is we may not leave and we may stay there for longer than you and I intended to stay. And so he says, you need to have a mindset that flees evil or sin. So what are we supposed to do? Every time we see sin or evil, we're supposed to turn our backs and walk away. He said, if you want to live as an exile, then you need to develop this kind of mindset. The fifth kind of mindset that he says to develop is to live honorably in our host country. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. In verse number 12, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, exiles witness and don't withdraw. Good works of the believers should be reflected in every area of our life. As you look back and ask yourself, how did I do this last week? We need to live a lifestyle that wins the argument and points people to the gospel. I know as I think about this myself, I think that many a times we choose to do what's convenient for us. We don't see that we need to have this kind of mindset that, that is to live honorably in our host country. What's our host country? Our host country is the place where we live. If we live in Bangalore, are we living in a way where we are working and, and, and intently trying to do good works to win others to Christ? So Peter gives us five different mindsets that we can follow on how we are to prepare our minds for action. Peter doesn't stop there. Peter tells us why we are to live as an exile. Peter gives us reasons for living as an exile in a foreign land. Number one, he says, the exilic life plays an important role in representing God. You know, purpose drives us. And Peter is telling us that the reason as to why you should live a life that is exilic or life as an exile is because it plays an important role in representing God as priests in our daily life. In verse 5, you yourself, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to do what? To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What are these spiritual sacrifices that we can give to God? Our time, our talent, our treasure. In the Old Testament, the priest would sacrifice to God and they would represent the people. Romans 12.1 says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Can we then say a complete dedication is a sacrifice that we can make to God? The Christian exile also gets to represent God everywhere he goes. The Christian exile gets to represent God at workplace. He gets to represent God in the community. He gets to represent God at home. Have you ever thought of this, mother and father, that you get to represent your children to God and to be a priest to them? What if we saw every opportunity and interaction as a way to serve God and represent our friends? He says the exilic life plays an important role at representing God as priests in our daily lives. That's the first one. Number two, he gives us another reason. He says the exilic life is one of honor and not of shame. If you come with me to verse number six, the last part, and he says, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. You know, the audience that Peter was writing to, their morals and convictions caused them to be second-class citizens. And Peter is reminding them that no matter who cancels you or who dishonors you, 
we are honored by God. Think of all the people that have suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. You know that one day that they will receive great honor from God. Society can dishonor us. They can even cancel us at times. But true honor is only given by God. We may look for it in other places, but true honor, according to Peter, is only given to us by God and for those who are in Christ. The third reason that Peter gives us to live the exilic life is the exilic life has one mission, that is to be an advertisement for the gospel. The exilic life has one mission, that is to be an advertisement for the gospel, a banner for the gospel. In verse number 9, after he gives us the fact that you are chosen, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, what does he say? Why, do, why are we all of that? That you may proclaim the ex excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The exilic life has to be one mission, and that one mission is this, that we are banners for the gospel. You know, in, uh, you, we get this wonderful opportunity as exiles to look to God and look back and see that we were not a people, but now we are a people. We did not have mercy, but now we have mercy. We look back and we see that we were not redeemed with gold, silver, and precious stones, but you were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. What would be the reason that we cannot be a banner for Jesus, for the gospel? We fail to do so sometimes by just keeping quiet. You know, many a times when the opportunity is given to us, we just keep quiet. And Peter is saying, one of the reasons that you are in exile is that you can be a banner for the gospel. Another reason sometimes is pride. Sometimes we're just too proud, and we sometimes then decide that we are not going to stretch forth and be an advertisement for the gospel. You know, the funny fact is when something good happens in our life, we seem to be the kind of people that want to tell people that something good has happened. You know, when you have a birthday, you want to let everybody know that you have a birthday. When you get married, you want everybody to know that you get married. It, it, it's even so frivolous that when we have good food at a good restaurant, we want people to know that this is a good restaurant. But then Peter is asking what happened when God has redeemed you, not with gold, silver, and precious stones, but by his precious blood. Why is it that you and I cannot advertise his marvelous excellencies who brought us from darkness into light. There could be nothing more special than what took place for us on that cross. So Peter says, the exilic life has to be one mission to be an advertisement for the gospel. Number four, the exilic life strategy is one of good works that ultimately makes God big. This is the crux. This is the main thing that Peter's been driving to in verse 12. In verse 12, he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. He's writing all of these things, and he comes to verse 12. And he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Peter's encouraging us to see the end goal as many that will come to know Jesus as their Savior. God would receive maximum glory when all men and women through the gospel find Jesus. I was thinking about this and I came to this thought, there's 1.4 billion people in India alone. And you know and I know that a lot of them are dying and going to an eternity in hell. What is our strategy as an exile? Peter is saying that our strategy should be that we should do good works that ultimately will make God bake. 
You know, the nation of Israel became a failure to proclaim God to the nations around them because sin took a hold of their lives. Many a times we think that it's the church's role to attract people to Christ. But then we've learned that we are the church. Then we are the ones that are supposed to attract people to Christ and people to the gospel. We read Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, that we are supposed to be the salt and light of the world. I want to give you some concluding applications and I'll give you the takeaway. Five applications that we can look at this morning. How we communicate as an exile matters. It affects how the gospel is communicated and it also affects the gospel community. Have you thought about this? How we communicate matters. You know, our, our words and our actions are constantly either directing people away from the gospel or towards the gospel. And it's important that if we are born again, that we have this desire for the spiritual milk to grow up and to communicate the way we were supposed to communicate in love. Number two, we develop an appetite on the basis of what we are consuming. An exile needs to have an appetite for the living word. Uh, you know, you consume what you crave, and today for appetite, we have options, right? Uh, I don't know, on my, um, my TV, we have OTT, or the, 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 the platforms that you have. I think there are 16 or 17 different platforms that you can have of things that you can consume on a daily basis. Uh, we have our phones, we have social media, we have several apps, we have so many things that are demanding our attention. It's hard to develop an appetite for the Word of God when other things are competing for our attention. And so it's important for us to ask, and maybe even take an inventory this week, and ask ourselves, how did I do this last week? You know, what, what was my reading habit for this last week? What did I spend my time on? this last week? How did I consume and what kind of appetite have I developed for spiritual food? An exile needs to have an appetite for the living word. Number three, the world and Satan are constantly trying to define and tell you who you are instead of allowing the living word to define who we are. Friends, I cannot tell you how much we are affected by this word identity. The secular world talks about identity. They know that how we think about ourselves matters in how we bring about change. And if you and I are not confident in the identity that has been given to us by Jesus Christ, then you and I will struggle to live as exiles in this world. Number four, we are at war and it matters who wins. It is easier to adopt the lifestyle of the host country of, or where we live than to wage war with the passions of our flesh. I know that it's true in my own life that it's so much more easier to assimilate, to just be like everybody else than to stand up and walk away from evil. Realize that you are at war and that you are fighting a battle every single day with sin, the devil. And if you can realize that, then whenever we are confronted by sin, we should turn around and walk the other direction. Number five, we are important to the city. We said that our 10-year goal was that we wanted to be uh, a church for the city and church for the nations. If we are important to the city, and one cannot retreat. That is, we cannot go back into our bubble and say, you know, we are going through all of these difficulties. Let's just all congregate, and let's just retreat from the world. We cannot rebel. We cannot resist. Or we cannot assimilate. But rather, we are called to declare the goodness of God to our hosts. This is what 
the crux of what Peter is talking to us is about. He says, live as exiles, show others that through your good works and point them to the gospel. We are important to the city and we cannot retreat, we cannot rebel, or we cannot assimilate, but rather we are called to declare the goodness of God to the people around us. Let me give you a takeaway this morning. Simple takeaway, but think about it through the week. Develop an exilic mindset and become a gospel conduit of good works that point others to the gospel. You know, I, I thought about this, and it's not easy to live as a visitor or a foreigner when we're so used to living in this world. Our jobs have become important. Our children have become important. Uh, everything that we do in a day, on a daily basis has become so important that we've forgotten that we are not men and women and children of this world, that our citizenship does not belong here. And so it's important for us to develop this exilic mindset and become this gospel conduit that God wants us to be, that reveals his marvelous works, that he brought us from darkness to light. He wants us to show the world that we were not redeemed with gold, silver, and precious stones, but we were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We need to become a gospel conduit of good works that point others to the gospel. How can we live as an exilic community rather than adopt the host culture? Are we so entrenched or sucked into society that we've stopped being the salt and the light that we are supposed to be? The exilic life is not easy, but that is what we are called to live. And with God's help and the enablement of the Holy Spirit, we have everything that we need to live this life. And so, may I urge you as you go through this week and as you go through your discussions in your life groups this week, that we would challenge each other, that we would develop this mindset. Peter is, you know, no stranger to suffering. And a few years from now, he's martyred. And Peter is writing to us that we are to live as foreigners and sojourners and ex exiles, as visitors in this world. May God help us. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much that you have given us what we need. And Father, the reason that we need to be learning your word is because it reveals who you are. A God that loved us so much that you redeemed us with this, your precious blood of your Son. Father, we pray that we would spend time in your word, that we would learn and equip ourselves to live as exiles, as foreigners, and realize that we do not belong here. We belong in a different place that we're just passing through. Help us, Father, as we do this this week. Enable us through your Holy Spirit to do the things that you've called us to do and live the life that you've called us to do. We ask that you bless each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.